Good morning. This is Alyssa Ward. It is 10.59 and we are going to begin our webcast in just a few moments. Looks like we are up to 149 attendees at this time. Our average has been over 400. We're going to give the usual leeway to allow the stream of folks to enter the call. Eleven oh one. I'm going to aim to start this call at eleven oh four. We're up to two hundred and four participants. It's 11.03, we are up to 239 attendees and I'm going to begin in just about one minute. Okay, we've hit 11.04. We have 275 attendees at this time. I am going to go ahead and get us rolling. So good morning. Today, uh, you will notice that 
some of our DMS staff are appearing via video. Uh, the risk that we run here is that we also are uh, working at home with our spouses and multiple children. So we are running the risk of uh, you all seeing children run into the room. So that might be your last day. Uh, today is April 22nd, 2020. And this is our sixth in a series of weekly calls for Medicaid behavioral health providers. Uh, we're seeking to provide verbal updates on our response to the COVID-19 state of emergency and the associated guidance that we have put out to this point. My name is Dr. Alyssa Ward. I am the Behavioral Health Clinical Director at DMAS, and we appreciate you being here with us today. We are continuing to hold call via this WebEx format. Um, we are in event format, so that means that all participants who, let me just check, we are up to 295. You are all automatically muted. You can communicate with us, the panelists, through the Q&A and chat functions on the right side of your screen if you are joining over your computer or your smartphone. Please reserve the chat function for technical questions, um, logistical questions, and then the Q&A section is there and allows you to directly inquire um, to us regarding some of the topics we're discussing, and then we can respond to you directly. It allows for a more organized question and response format. We, as usual, will hope to get to all of those questions and answers that we are able to answer today. And if not, uh, we will add those and roll them into our frequently asked questions or get back to you after the call. So we wanna to continue to thank you for all collaboration and feedback during the time of crisis. Um, six weeks now, we are six weeks into these uncharted waters together. Um, we continue to receive a pretty high volume of calls and emails on a daily basis, uh, seeking further clarification around the guidance that has been issued. So we want to start by referencing the two menu memos that we have already released um, on this guidance and the provider flexibilities are available on the DMAS website. Uh, we continue to work on finalizing that FAQ document. It is in final approvals today, so we anticipate that it will be posted very soon, hopefully the next couple of days. Um, and we have um, also assured that we have alignment in all of those FAQs across uh, different interagency factors and guidance. And uh, we've also been reviewing these frequently asked questions on these calls each week. Um, as an effort to kind of keep that information flowing to you prior to the FAQ being officially posted. And um, we will continue to evolve that document as other questions arise and the situation uh, unfolds. I'm joined again today by Dr. Cleopatra Booker, um, our Senior Program Advisor in Behavioral Health, and Ash Carroll, our Senior Program Advisor uh, for Arts. We are also joined by Laura Reed today, who is our Behavioral Health Division Manager, and she is going to be delivering some of this content as well. So on this call, we're going to be providing a review of some of the frequently asked questions, uh, some additional ones that we either see uh, continuing to come in. Um, so we want to try to level set on those or new ones. Um, that are kind of taking a different angle or question on some of the guidance. So we'll be discussing those today. Um, these are related to that guidance document, which is entitled Behavioral Health and Arts Provider Flexibilities Related to COVID-19, which was released on March 27th. Um, before we move on to those specifically asked questions, I do want to make a few global statements about the processes we're undergoing and some common questions we've received about DMAS activities. So starting this week, we would like to announce that we are going to move these provider calls to a biweekly cadence. That is every other week cadence. Um, if the COVID state of emergency or our policy responses evolve in such a way that we need to return to a weekly cadence, uh, we will respond to that need. Um, but for the time being, we want to take a little bit of a breath to protect our team's resiliency for the long haul. And so, uh, we're going to move these to that biweekly cadence. Um, as noted on the last call, we are pleased to share that we've been able to upload uh, some of the past call content to our DMAS website, and that's on your screen right now, uh, where you can find 
those postings and we're working uh, with our internal team to um, get some of the provider provided uh, calls that we weren't able to record. And I do believe that we are able to record today. I see a red light on and I think that tells me that we are indeed successfully recording this. And so we hope that this one will be updated and put on the website too as well. Um, as you're seeing, DMS has a COVID-19 specific section of our website um, that includes one pagers and documents that may be helpful to both members and providers, including um, the forthcoming frequently asked questions. And we have a new resource that was posted last week and reviewed on this call in case you weren't here. This is a telehealth decision tree. So mahalo to our colleagues in Hawaii. Um, who were the first to develop this and we got permission to adapt it for Virginia and have vetted it across the agencies. So it is there as a reference point and a tool for your um, colleagues as you think about decisions around um, when to default to telehealth and in what situations you may have to um, rely on face-to-face -face interaction and then what precautions should be taken in the case that you need to see a member face-to-face. -face. We also want to speak today about um, Executive Order 57. So this executive order um, is regarding licensing healthcare professionals in response to coronavirus. And it was made effective April 17th. And this uh, executive order, if you have not seen it, and we hope you have, um, essentially says that clinical psychologists, professional counselors, marriage and family therapists, and clinical social workers with active licenses issued by another state, so this is essentially LMHPs who are active in another state, may be issued a temporary license by endorsement as a healthcare partner of the same type um, for which the license is issued in another state upon submission of an application. Um, and information requested by the applicable licensing board and the board's verification that the applicant's licensed, the applicant's license issued by another state is active and a good standing. But there are no current reports um, in the US Department of Health and Human Services National Practitioner Data Bank. You just saw my child. Um, so <laughs> Essentially, this is really important um, that Virginia has moved on this um, to allow for this temporary license by endorsement um, for several reasons. We know that we have a shortage of LMHPs here in Virginia, and um, depending upon when um, the height of the virus may be, uh, we anticipate that that could affect our LMHPs bandwidth. Um, some of them could become ill, they could become overwhelmed in terms of their um, caseloads. And this would allow for either practitioners here in Virginia who are not currently licensed here, um, they could quickly um, bring on this temporary license by endorsement, um, or it could allow for licensed practitioners in neighboring states to get that endorsement and provide telehealth services. Um, should providers contract with them uh, to bring in help from other places. So uh, we've seen this happen in other places and we're um, happy to see it happening here in Virginia. Um, this temporary license will be, um, it's going to expire 90 days after the state of emergency ends. Um, and during that time, the practitioner can also seek a full Virginia license or transition patients to a Virginia licensed practitioner. Next slide. So um, healthcare practitioners who have an active license issued by this by another state, um, they can provide continuity of care to their patients who are Virginia residents through these telehealth services that we have all been doing. Uh, a healthcare practitioner may use any non-public facing audio or remote communication product that is available. Um, so again, this is re that guidance is reiterating uh, the kind of federal waiver on um, allowing for non-HIPAA compliant methods of um, telehealth communication at this time. Um, and there is, of course, a caution around discretion um, for provision of telehealth for any reason, regardless of whether the telehealth service is related to the diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19, just being sure that this is a good match for the service being offered. 
Um, interns, residents, fellows with active temporary training licenses to practice medicine issued by the Virginia Board of Medicine may practice in a hospital, including a clinic or alternative care facility operated by a hospital without the supervision of a licensed physician or fully licensed member um, of the applicable faculty program at all times. Um, so basically this is allowing, you know, that there doesn't have to be that on-site issue uh, for residents and supervisees. Next slide. This is where you can follow the link to see this executive order. Um, this is really applicable to DHP. Um, but we worked with DHP um, on this process. And so we wanna thank them for their partnership um, and moving this forward. Next slide. So we do have some brief updates today on the 1135 waiver. Uh, we noted last week that that waiver had been submitted. And this is some background information that I will provide again, uh, particularly because we were unable to record the last call. Uh, but an 1135 waiver is, um, is a new process for most people um, in healthcare right now, because these are um, really only brought up during um, presidential declaration of a disaster or emergency. And there has to be a simultaneous declaration of a public health emergency by the health and human services secretary. So when those two pieces come together, um, the secretary is then authorized to take certain actions in addition to their regular authorities. And one of those actions is issuing an 1135 waiver. Um, under section 1135, the Social Security Act, the secretary of HHS can temporarily modify or waive certain Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, or HIPAA requirements. And these are those 1135 waivers. So there's different kinds of 1135 waivers, including Medicare blanket waivers. Um, and not everything in an 1135 is related to Medicaid. Next slide. Uh, CMS has issued a blanket waiver allowing states to move forward with certain allowances without having to request that flexibility from CMS. Um, and we included the link so you could see that blanket waiver. For additional flexibilities, each state has to submit an application to CMS for approval. And that is, there are internal approvals, there are state-based approvals and negotiations before it goes to CMS. Um, so Virginia submitted their 1135 waiver application last week and we are, uh, it has been received. There have been some items that um, it sounds like uh, CMS is amenable to approving and others that we are still in negotiations around. Um, so we don't have a final on that 1135 as of this morning. Um, as we'll release guidance, so there will be a, a very specific memo that will come out around the 1135 guidance. Um, and there is an Appendix K um, that is relevant to home and community-based waiver services. Um, this was approved, and so we are in the process of publishing a memo. It's in preparation for release that provides an overview um, of what is in that K and its implications for providers. Thanks. So now I'm going to hand this over. Um, to Laura Reed, who's going to review some of the other resources that we um, would like to make you aware of, some internal to DMAS and some other just generally resources. So take it away, Laura. Good morning. Can you hear me? Sure can. Great. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, nice to be um, out from behind the screen this morning and, and with you this morning. Um, I'm going to try and um, pat my head and rub my tummy at the same time this morning in terms of running the WebEx. I'm actually speaking to everybody, so bear with me. Um, the current slide talks about our uh, some of our DMS internal um, trainings that we are doing and our support at grant team facilitating these weekly trainings on various topics. We're very proud of this team as they have really pushed to meet the ever-changing needs of our BH system during our state of emergency. Um, please note that the Q&A sessions at the top of the slide are geared towards SUD providers. However, the other trainings, um, the client engagement, 
um, crisis and de-escalation and suicide um, are geared towards all providers, including mental health and STD. Um, so we're excited to have those ongoing. Um, and feel free to reach out to JC Moe if you have any questions um, about those trainings. His email address is on this slide. Our next resource is um, a resource that um, one of our uh, employees in our behavioral health division, Stephanie Pale, she's uh, one of our mental health program specialists. She's an LCSW as well as a play therapist, has reviewed. It is a free um, one hour webinar about adapting play therapy to telehealth sessions. Um, and she gave, uh, she reviewed this and gave uh, this webinar a thumbs up. Um, so hopefully it will be helpful to the providers that are providing play therapy. Our next resource um, actually came to us via uh, our colleagues at DBHDF, um, and they sent this over to us. Um, it is a resource center within the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Um, it's got some pretty interesting uh, resources about access to care, child and family well-being, child welfare, um, health plans, Medicaid, et cetera. But what I thought was really cool uh, was this interactive um, math that they have about how other states, including Virginia, are expanding their telehealth um, services through Medicaid. Um, so you can look at some resources there. Um, the next couple slides um, are a repeat uh, from last week's uh, behavioral health call, um, but we still think are really important and poignant. Um, so the National Council for Behavioral Health um, has um, lots of different resources on their website um, for small businesses, um, about Medicaid and telehealth, um, about um, different funding sources, um, personal protective equipment, things like that. They've got some toolkits um, and definitely some really interesting resources for providers on their website, so take a look. And then the last slide, um, We've gotten some questions um, in our enhanced DH mailbox about financial resources for providers. Um, and just wanted to let you know that DMAS is working with CMS consultants and the NCOs around financial relief and support. Um, but in the meantime, here is a guide which we, that you might find useful for providers. This guide breaks out the various levels of support uh, for Virginia businesses. There are federal programs, state programs, and private sector programs. Uh, for information, uh, you can visit the Center for Innovative Technology website. Additionally, the COVID-19 telehealth program will provide $200 million in funding appropriated by Congress as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act to help healthcare providers provide connected care services to patients at their homes or mobile locations in response to the novel coronavirus 2019 disease pandemic. The program will provide immediate support to eligible providers responding to the COVID-19 pandemic by fully funding their telecommunication services, information services, and devices necessary to provide critical connected care services until the program's funds have been extended or the COVID-19 pandemic has ended. You can visit the Federal Communications Commission's website uh, for additional information um, on the qualifiers and the application process for this. Um, before I hand it over to Dr. Booker, I just wanted to let you know that um, we are committed to providing these additional resources to our provider community, um, such as the ones we discussed. Um, but at this time, we're unable to answer any specific questions about these resources, and I encourage you guys to connect uh, with the agencies that provide these resources if you have questions. Um, I hope you found this helpful, and now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Cleopatra Booker. She's going to review um, some general questions um, that have come up, um, and then some mental health questions that have come up. You will note that some of these questions are repeats. Um, from previous calls, um, but we continue to get a high volume of questions um, about these topics, so we just wanted to review them. So, Dr. Booker? Hello, everyone. Um, 
So I decided to show my face uh, with Dr. Ward today. <laughs> so don't be surprised if you see one of my many children uh, come through the door as well. Uh, so for the FAQs, we have split them up into general FAQs this time, and then uh, more specifically towards mental health as FAQs. So already within the chat, one person has asked, just we wanted to be clarified that um, are we, are we provide group services face to face? If not, when will this be allowed again? So at this time, with the first DMAS memo, it indicated no, these services shall not be provided to a group of individuals at the same time and location, except for family members or kinship in the same location to promote containment of COVID infection. Face-to-face uh, -face group interventions are being allowed um, uh, in a group setting via telehealth but you cannot do it uh, physically face-to-face. -face. And when the governor notifies the state agencies that there will be plans to lift social distancing practices, at that time, we will make a determination of the time frame um, and also other several factors uh, to notify that group practices and other things that uh, people have adapted to needs to be put back into place. When we are modifying or changing any of the requirements, we will make sure that we continue to keep everybody posted via these provider calls as well as the official Medicaid memos. Question two out of five. May groups occur through telehealth or conference calls with audio visual capabilities? Um, as well as our participants able to uh, do it in their home or individual locations. So yes, groups can occur via telehealth and it's recommended that therapeutic groups are conducted with both audio and video communications. Well, we know that groups delivered by video conference are feasible and they potentially can improve the accessibility of group interventions, especially during this time. So we encourage groups to actually occur via telehealth or conference call and with audio and visual capabilities. Question three out of five. Uh, this is referring to a provider call that we had on April 2nd. DMAS reported they would be researching resources for financial support for providers. What resources have DMAS found and will DMAS be providing financial resources to providers? Currently, DMAS has not received approval to create any sort of unified mechanism to assist providers with financial hardships. However, we are working to review other states as well as we're working with CMS and consultants on a plan of action to possibly move forward um, with requesting adjustments that may be able to assist providers financially. Uh, we already provided sort of, you know, information on this call that you all can feel free to look into in regards to several different resources, including the grant opportunity um, that is being given to community mental health providers, which are trying to develop telehealth practices. Question four out of five. How the requirements for assessment updates change? The requirements for assessment updates have not changed with the exception that we're allowing assessments to occur through telehealth. So please continue to follow the practice guidelines or the psych services manual, the CMHRS manual in regards to comprehensive needs assessments, case management assessments, ISP updates, and as well as the arts assessments requirements within the manual. Question five out of five, how do I submit claims without an authorization since ZMAS is allowing providers 14 days to submit an authorization? I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, please do not submit a claim that requires an authorization without getting the authorization first. It will deny and that is an appropriate claim denial. Although DMAS is allowing providers 14 days to submit the authorization, if a provider waits until 14 days to submit that off, they cannot submit the claim on the 12th day prior to getting the authorization. So please, please make sure that your business practices is, is aligning with your offs and your claims processing. Um, so if the authorization is not in place prior to the claim being submitted, it will deny. But you do have an additional 14 days after you've started a service now to submit an authorization to an MCO it will not be automatically approved. There's 
financial necessity criteria being reviewed. So you do risk that there will be potentially a denial and you've already delivered the service, but this is intended to allow um, everyone to adjust to the current pandemic. And we also understand that there may be delays with submitting authorizations, but you cannot, number one, you cannot assume that medical necessity will be approved because you submitted the authorization after starting the service. And then number two, if you submit the claim before getting an authorization, it will appropriately deny the claim. So please make sure you have the off prior to submitting a claim. Next, we're going to jump over to FAQs for dental health. So the question for mental health services has to do with Medicare. Medicare currently does not allow providers to submit claims for therapy services conducted via the telephone using the traditional therapy codes like the non-non codes. Uh, providers are asking, if I'm seeing a member that has Medicare and Medicaid, can I bill Medicaid for the therapy services conducted via telephone or audio only? If a member has both the Medicare and Medicaid, providers shall continue to follow Medicare CMS rules for behavioral health services that are covered by Medicare. If the provider type is not recognized by Medicare, Medicaid then becomes primary and the provider may follow the Medicaid guidelines for behavioral health services. We have put down here some of the Medicare telephone service codes that are currently allowed to be billed. Um, and then if you want more information about Medicare billing practices during the public health emergency, we've also put the link here. Question two out of four, can I transfer all therapeutic day treatment clients to intensive in services? I can see why the question is being raised um, because intensive in-home services at this time, you can go into the home and you can continue to get the full rate and there is no limit because you're doing the service as is. But it is important to remember that the youth still has to meet medical necessity criteria for intensive in-home services in order to receive the service. So you cannot just automatically transfer all of the TDT clients to start receiving intensive in-home services. Last week, we, we went over the difference and the similarities between TDT and intensive in-home. Um, just as a reminder, TDT has a different focus than intensive in-home. Intensive in-home is mainly focused on family dynamics within the home. And TDT is focused on those behavioral health interventions that are typically during a school. Question three out of four. When providing telehealth CMHRS services, is there a minimum duration to bill? There is no minimum duration to bill, but a billable service must be provided. For example, attempts for telehealth or telephonic contacts that were unsuccessful is not a billable service. For traditional behavioral health services, like individual family and group therapy services, please continue to bill the amount of time the service was delivering delivered using the correct billing codes that demonstrate the amount or hours or minutes for the service. And the last mental health question, question four out of four. Will there be future flexibilities for clients to receive intensive in-home and TDT if treatment goals and interventions are not duplicated so that the individual does not lose the relationship that they may have had with their TDT staff? For instance, if TDT and intensive in-home were not billed on the same day, would this be acceptable? At this time, TDT in the home and intensive in-home services in the home are not allowed for the same number. It is considered a duplication of services. A TDT provider could provide a service through telehealth to the individual while the individual is also receiving intensive in-home services. But during these situations, please make sure that there is care coordination occurring. So repeat that again, sort of in different terms. Um, TDT and intensive in-home services cannot both be provided face-to-face -face physically in the person's home. So if someone is already receiving intensive in-home, a TDT provider could not go into the home as well. But if the TDT provider is providing telehealth to the individual, both services can continue at the same time. Additionally, if intensive in-home is doing telehealth and TDT is doing telehealth, they both can continue to occur and it should continue to meet medical necessity criteria. 
Whenever both of those services are involved, there should be high, high care coordination between both services. It doesn't matter if it's the same provider providing intensive in-home and TDT or two different providers providing TDT and intensive in-home. There should be a very tight, close-knit care coordination relationship between both of those services to the relationship and nature of those services. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Harrell to jump into our addiction recovery treatment services updates. Thank you, Dr. Booker. Um, so I just have some brief updates related to substance use disorder treatment services. Um, yesterday, uh, SAMHSA updated their frequently asked questions. Um, so I've posted that link uh, for you there at the bottom of the slide. Um, it basically covered um, the clarification that um, there is an allowance for treating new patients with buprenorphine via telehealth or telephonic means. Um, and this is for all uh, data 2000 waiver practitioners or the buprenorphine waiver practitioners, as well as opiate treatment programs. SAMHSA continues to require the methadone initiation uh, to be done through an in-person uh, physical exam. Opiate treatment programs can continue to treat existing patients using methadone or buprenorphine via telehealth or telephonic means. Um, and then the rest of the guidance uh, was additional clarifications for opiate treatment programs uh, regarding medical directors as well as their mid-level practitioner roles in these settings during the pandemic. Next slide. Um, I wanted to just share um, that we are seeing spikes in around the Commonwealth. Uh, just this morning, I was alerted that Chesterfield County um, has also seen an increase in overdoses. So I wanted to make you aware of this resource uh, with naloxone training uh, and additional resources. So to get trained on naloxone distribution, there is the website getnaloxonenow.org. You can register there and enter your zip code to access the free online training. There's also the resource for the Chris Atwood Foundation, and I've got the link there. We'll send out the slides after the presentation today to be able to contact the Chris Atwood Foundation uh, to be able to obtain the lockdown for Virginia residents. And then also, if an individual has a prescription called in Medicaid, uh, and they go to their local pharmacy, Medicaid will cover the cost of the naloxone uh, at no cost to the member. So there's no service authorization um, nor co-pays for Medicaid members to get um, naloxone prescriptions. Uh, also, before uh, we transition to the next slide, I wanted to um, just remind folks in the on March 27th memorandum, uh, we did have some allowances for individuals that are in a residential type setting, and this applies to arts uh, levels uh, 3.1 uh, to 3.7, as well as the inpatient setting 4.0. Um, this also applies to psychiatric residential treatment facilities, therapeutic group homes, the early and periodic screening, diagnosis and treatment, EPSCT, PTRF, PRTF, excuse me, and therapeutic group homes. And this is something that Dr. Booker covered um, during our last call, um, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize this, is this is just not um, when individuals are in a residential setting and they are no longer needing to be in that level of care because they do not meet medical necessity. DMAS has uh, the allowance for uh, members to be able to stay in that level if they're not able to transition to a lower level of care due to COVID-19 or quarantines. However, this is not a blanket um, open-ended authorization. Providers uh, will need to um, request a service authorization for members who are unable discharge due to barriers related to COVID-19. And when they submit the service authorization, we ask that they answer the following questions um, and submitting this on the service authorization 
um, formally online or through a telephonic interview with the managed care organization or our behavioral health services administrator. So the six questions that providers will need to address are, what are the barriers to discharge related to COVID-19? Providers must describe attempts to overcome these barriers since the last service request authorization was submitted. What are the restrictions and or limitations for step down to the identified discharge disposition? What aftercare services are available in their community during this pandemic? What agencies has this individual been referred to? And then lastly, how will the treatment plan and goals be adjusted to sustain current progress and prevent regression? Um, so I wanted to point that out. Um, our managed care organizations and the Behavioral Health Services Administrator will be looking for these questions to be answered to be able to extend service authorizations when members no longer meet medical necessity criteria for those levels of care. All right, Laura, I am going to pass it. Over, I guess we are reviewing the uh, provider questions in our Q&A. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Booker. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> So I've been trying to answer the Q&As as they pop up. Um, right now we are at questions regarding ABA therapy. There appears to be um, maybe some miscommunications or something we need to follow up with the MCOs about just to make sure that there is currently no guidance that is limiting any units other than what's already like posted on the DMAS website in regards to guidance of what we've been reviewing on the calls. Um, the only limit is when you're using audio only services is that one unit a day, but there are no like particular service additional guidance. If it's not in the CMHRS manual or the, or the psychiatric services manual, we have not enforced any additional like limits on services. So, um, with behavioral therapy, there is no limit of, you know, like 500 units a day or any, I mean, a, a month or anything like that. Um. So just we'll, we'll follow up and make sure that there is no uh, concerns there, but I, I'm not aware of any at this time. Um, also, we have been advised to request hours based on medical recommendations as opposed to client availability. Do we need to change our guidance to our staff? Uh, with that question, we should always be Seeing the amount of hours based upon, I guess, clinical recommendations or medical necessity criteria. Uh, of course, you always have to factor in when the clients may be available to receive the service, but the amount of hours that you need uh, would be based upon medical necessity. And yeah, there's there's no limits to that. There's another question: Is DMAS working with Department of Corrections and DJJ to ensure Medicaid can be? reinstated as inmates and youth are released. Dr. Ward, would you like to take that question? Dr. Ward, this is sure. Ashley. I can take this question. Um, so yes, um, we are having conversations with um, Department of Corrections as well as DCJS. Um, currently, um, the Cover Virginia is working to ensure that the 2,000 um, individuals that are being released during uh, the state of emergency that the governor um, is allowing for early release, uh, that they will focus those priorities to get those individuals um, flipped over to full Medicaid benefits. Um, and they are being treated as a unit of one. Um, and so if they meet eligibility requirements as a unit of one, uh, that they will be Medicaid eligible. I want to emphasize that these individuals, once released, uh, will be in a fee-for-service benefit, um, and it will take uh, the system probably two weeks up to a little over a month to cycle in and assign these individuals to a managed care organization. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and just to note, in, 
terms of that question or others like it, you know, there's significant collaboration going on across all of the agencies um, in terms of COVID response. And there are different members of DMAS, some on our team, some beyond our team who um, are working on all of the congregate care issues, um, including um, the Department of Corrections, Department of Juvenile Justice, and there's lots of different ways that the COVID response is intersecting um, amongst those entities. So we are trying to stay in the conversation um, as well from a behavioral health lens and the needs of those populations. And uh, Ashley, would you be able to go over again those six questions that providers should be prepared or submitting with their authorization request when they're asking to extend um, an authorization request due to quarantine or COVID-19 barriers? And I just want to remind providers that those six questions are also the same ones for psychiatric residential treatment as well as psychiatric inpatient and arts residential care when you are asking to extend an authorization because of COVID-19 or quarantine efforts. Hi, Dr. Booker. Yes, I will go over those again and I've tried to paste them in the question see that, section actually. and it's not letting me um, Paste the whole thing, so I'll see what I can do. But question number one, what are the barriers to discharge related to COVID-19? Question two, please describe attempts to overcome these barriers since the last service request authorization was submitted. Question three, what are the restrictions and or limitations for step down to the identified discharge disposition? Question four, what aftercare services are available in their community during this pandemic? Question five, what agencies has this individual been referred to? And then finally, question six, how will the treatment plan and goals be adjusted to sustain current progress and prevent regression? Ashley, this is Laura. We can develop a slide with this information, add it to the slide deck before we send it out uh, tomorrow. Great. Thank you, Laura. There's a question regarding TDT guidance for MCOs to limit or end authorizations. Um, if the authorization went through the current months, you do not have to request a new authorization. You continue forward delivering services with the authorization that you have. If it goes through June, then you continue using that authorization. If the authorization ended, um, you know, this month or in the coming months, then you would request a new auth at that time. But the MCOs are not ending authorization prematurely prior to the auth end date that was already determined. I also, can you all hear me? I wanna make note because there's a lot of questions um, coming in about the MCOs on this call and disconnect. I wanna note that the MCOs are on this call. They do participate and they hear this guidance. Um, so I just wanted to make sure y'all were clear that they are, they are in the conversation, they are listening. Um, they're you know, seeing these concerns. So there is actually a direct connection to them with them seeing these concerns um, as participants and attendees on this call. Um, just wanted to note that. I'm looking through some of the other questions. Um, and I'm checking the time. There are a number Ashley, of there's a, yeah, go ahead, Laura. Sorry. Ashley, there's a there's a question in the chat function from a J Phelps. Do you see that question? I am I'm going there now. 
I'm not sure we have an answer, but I just wanted to see if we did or not. Right. So for extended time available for residential patients, is the monthly summary required? Is this for, um, this is from uh, Ms. Donovan, is this for arts or the Children's Residential Treatment Services? If you can clarify that, then what we can do is go back and review the policies. It's at this time, the current thing, OBOT. I'm not seeing the OBOT question. I'm sorry. Can somebody read it to me? He's just, you wanted clarification on where this service was occurring, and, and Jay Feltz is saying OBOT. We don't have an answer, that's fine. We can return. Yep. We'll, we will return. Thank you. Um, I do see uh, about four questions or so related to TDT summer. Um, that whole process, that authorization process has not changed. Um, so if you, you know, plan on changing, I think the guidance prior to COVID-19 is whenever you change that modifier, you have to request the authorizations of the NCO so that they know that the modifier, the type of service is being changed in regards to TDT. So if that's the way that you typically did it before, then we request that you continue to do it that same way uh, moving forward. So for the summer, if you change your change your modifier, then uh, please request the authorization so that it can continue. If your modifier remains, then there is no need to extend it unless the authorization ends already with that date, that end date. And there's been a couple of questions about the Medicare codes that were provided uh, for Medicare providers. At that, at this time, those Medicare codes are not, they do not have uh, rates assigned to them for Virginia Medicaid. Uh, so that was just information because we were getting questions about how can providers get reimbursed for audio only services provided to a Medicare client because Medicare is not currently allowing the traditional behavioral health services codes to be reimbursed. Um, so those are the Medicare codes. We are evaluating those codes to see if it would be um, beneficial to assign regime Medicaid rates to them. But of course, when we do that, we have to, you know, completely think it through in regards to what type of guidance we would be giving to providers to use those specific codes versus the way that we're currently allowing it. Um, due to the, the way we're currently allowing it is a little bit easier for providers to adapt to. So, um, but at this time, it is not a uh, Medicaid service that has an assigned rate to it, the Medicare codes that were provided. So we just have about, let's see, about seven more minutes. So I wonder if, uh, Leo, you want to identify a couple more questions to answer verbally, and Ashley, if you want to see if there's two arts questions you want to try to tackle verbally, and then we will end the call and try to follow up. If your question was not answered, we'll try to get back to you. Um, but remember, all of these questions can also be sent to the enhanced BH or SUD mailboxes. I think we have pretty much covered the hot topic ones. As always, TDT is a hot topic. I see a new a new service, crisis stabilization. Has crisis stabilization changed as far as providing services? Can crisis utilize telehealth and receive same hours, or will it be will it be based upon the change? So yeah, crisis stabilization is the same. Um, it can same. be done via telehealth, and it is the same. There is no 
limits to uh, crisis stabilization being provided over the phone or via audio and visual communications. It is the same. That's for crisis save and intervention. And whether crisis uh, services delivery needs to happen face to face versus telehealth is really a clinical decision uh, based on the idiosyncratic situation that a provider is put in with this person. We hope that the telehealth guidance document will also help um, to think through that logic. Uh, but it really will depend on the individual situation and that's left to clinical uh, judgment. So I do want to thank everybody for being so flexible over these past six weeks we're at now, uh, where we've issued our kind of first guidance and started having these calls. We have consistently had over 350 participants on all six of the calls. So we can definitely tell that you all are dedicated to learning what's happening, following current guidance and practices. Uh, we uh, thank you for your partnership, your support, your willingness to put yourself out there and ask questions. Um, you know, we appreciate just your openness and your your ability to be so flexible. And so uh, we really are with you on this. We're trying to give you as much information as possible. Um, so we're with you. Um, we're partnering with you. I hope that you can feel it. And uh, we look can see it to, today and you can see it today. We care. We want you to see our faces. And so uh, thank you so much for being so consistent and flexible at the same time and for your partnership. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. We will talk to you in two weeks. Again, we are going to a biweekly cadence, two weeks, um, but be in touch over email if you have questions before that time. Thank you so much. Bye.